Welcome everybody to our, to our talk on survivorship and long-term follow-up for blood cancers. Today I've got a nurse specialist, Erin Kavanagh, with us. And she's going to look at um, the late effects assessment program and long-term follow-up with Starship. Well, that's where she works, but she's going to also include the adult um, long-term effects of cancer. If you have any questions for Erin, please pop them in the Q&A section on the bottom line. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. <laughs> um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I, um, so yeah, as Annette said, I am a pediatric nurse, but I will um, you know, talk about this from an adult perspective, hopefully. Um, and uh, I'm going to cover um, just a little bit of a brief overview of what we do at Starship Long Term Follow Up. But then I'll also talk about the long term effects of a blood cancer and, um, and self management of these, and also look at chemo brain. So at Starship, um, we have a, what's called a late effects assessment program. And this is actually a program that's um, national, it is also out of Christchurch and out of Wellington. Um, and it's a multidisciplinary clinic where we have an oncologist or a hematologist, a um, psychologist, and then a nurse specialist. And we run weekly clinics for this. So we see patients that could be anywhere um, from two years finishing their treatment up to about five years off treatment is when they first come into our program. And um, we see patients, the youngest patients that I've seen are from about four years of age, and we see them right through to 24 years of age. And we have different levels of follow-up. So we can start um, with a very low-risk patient who was a, a solid tumour who may have only had surgery um, as their treatment, right up to patients who have um, multiple treatment modalities and um, megatherapy with a hemopoietic stem cell transplant. And also um, some host patients are brain tumor patients that have had um, significant cranial or brain radiotherapy. And depending on the treatment that patients have, um, and if they have any long-term effects, we see them anywhere from six monthly to yearly to every two years. And um, we will actually continue to see patients for generally about 10 years once they're off treatment for their uh, cancer but sometimes we need to continue to see them if they were treated at quite a young age, right through until they've gone through puberty um, and have also uh, in their final years of schooling uh, up until university at times. And we discharge patients into the care of their general practitioner or GP. And we provide an individual, individualized surveillance program or surveillance recommendations for the potential long-term effects for them. So why long-term effects? So uh, we know that the number of survivors um, in New Zealand about at, at five years of treatment is estimated at, at 60,000 people, and that's about 1.5% of the New Zealand population. And um, recent advance, advances in not only cancer care, but early detection and the treatment, as well as an aging population have increased the numbers of cancer survivors. In blood can in, and in blood cancers, more patients are being cured of their disease or are being managed long term over an extended period of time. And as Dr. Weingove um, spoke about this morning, we the in, there is an increased ten year survival rate for blood cancers, and particularly in chronic myeloid leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and multiple myeloma. And as the number of survivors grow, it's really important to acknowledge that. Surviving cancer is associated with health problems and long-term effects. Um, in comparison to the general population, people who haven't had cancer, cancer survivors do have an increased lifetime risk of developing things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and osteoporosis. Most of these can actually be reduced by healthy lifestyle practices, and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, and, and how to manage your health. So what are long-term effects? So long-term effects are adverse effects that happen after you've finished your treatment for cancer or effects that don't resolve once you've finished your um, cancer treatment. 
they can actually occur immediately during that initial diagnosis phase and um, may not um, actually occur until a few years down the track. Um, there's a number of factors that can uh, impact on development of long-term effects and things like the type of cancer that you have, um, the types of treatment, uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, stem cell transplant can all impact uh, dose-related toxicity. So that means that some chemotherapy agents, if you were given low doses, may not develop uh, long-term effects, but if you were given significantly higher doses, then your risk is a lot higher. And one example of that is cyclophosphamide um, and fertility. So low dose cyclophosphamide, we wouldn't expect any issues, but high dose cyclophosphamide, we would expect some issues potentially with fertility. There's also some individual characteristics, uh, particularly around genetic predisposition, predisposition um, syndromes and the development of secondary cancers. Um, the cancer experience, particularly um, depending on your length of time in hospital as an inpatient, any protracted stay in hospital can increase the potential impact for psychological and psychosocial long-term effects. And if you've had a transplant, the uh, chronic or acute graft versus host disease can also impact on, on the development of long-term effects. So fortunately, um, most long-term survivors don't develop severe or serious long-term effects, but we know that catching these early is important, and that's to enable the management of them so that there's no minimal impact on your quality of life. And, um, you know, preparing for this talk, you, there's a long list of long-term effects that can happen. But if you think about it and you get, when you get a new medication, for example, and there's a list of all the side effects that you get with that, um, most of them won't apply to you, but there could be a couple that are really important for you. And so while I talk through quite a number of long-term effects, just remember that some of these may not apply to you. But it is still important to know about these and how to be well equipped to effectively manage your health and your quality of life. So we'll kind of do a little virtual tour of the body and I'll start with um, the brain. Um, so cognitive impairment or intellectual impairment um, can occur and this is often seen in people that have difficulties with memory, concentration, attention, organization and problem solving. And there are treatments that increase the risk of this occurring and brain radiation, um, total body irradiation, hemopoietic stem cell transplant, even high dose methotrexate and cytarabine um, can increase this risk. Other factors like uh, anxiety, depression, fatigue, poor sleep um, can also add to this. And so um, seeing a psychologist, uh, particularly a neuropsychologist and having a neuropsychological assessment are sometimes used to assess brain functioning and they can be really useful because they can provide a plan for specific recommendations to manage your, your weaknesses, but also utilize your strengths. And so given that I'm gonna talk about chemo brain a little bit later, we'll talk about self-management and coping, oh, sorry, coping strategies um, later when we talk about the chemo uh, and chemo brain. So moving on to eyes, if we go down, some medicines, busulfan, for example, and uh, corticosteroids, so prednisone, dexamethasone, radi any radiation to the head, brain, eye and surrounding areas, as well as TBI, can increase the risk of uh, developing cataracts or a clouding of the lens of the eye. And you can get other symptoms associated with this, including blurring of vision, uh, a double vision, even sensitivity to the light. And it is important that, you know, if you're going for your routine check out with your doctor, have, or GP, have an eye examination. For those that have had radiation and TBI, total body irradiation, seeing an ophthalmologist, uh, or an optometrist regularly um, can really be helpful to monitor that. If you do develop some of these symptoms, uh, ophthalmologists will monitor you closely for an extended period of time and may um, lead to needing some surgery to correct those cataracts. 
So keeping your eyes as healthy as, as possible is important. Um, the you protecting yourself from UV light, so wearing sunglasses. Um, and also if you work with hazardous materials, wearing protective eyewear to, to protect your eyes is important. And if you do get an injury or uh, have something hazardous in your eyes, seeing a, a doctor, getting medical attention right away is important. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and so moving on, we'll go to um, some of the nerves. So I think actually you probably just heard a talk on peripheral neuropathy, so that's really great. Um, so sorry if I am covering some of what was already spoken about, but it will just be brief. Um, some chemotherapies, so vinca alkaloids, you've been Christine, for example, can cause a numbness, uh, tingling, weakness of your hands and feet and these may improve once your treatment is stopped but for some it actually can continue for months or years uh, after the treatment has finished finished so treatment should focus on symptom management and um, balance stability and gait should be assessed particularly in those with poor bone health and if you haven't done exercise for an extended period of time it's really important to check um, that what exercise you're going to undertake is appropriate for you. In older adult, adults, the risk of falls should also be assessed and balance um, training may be needed. So physiotherapists can actually help to improve your strength, balance and coordination and, and um, GPs may be able to prescribe some pain management. Um, the podiatrists have probably already spoken about focusing recommendations for your feet, but wearing comfortable shoes that aren't too tight or too loose. And massaging hands and feet can also be soothing and actually boost your own natural endorphins for pain relief. Hearing loss is another area of um, nerve damage and can result from chem some chemotherapy agents, cisplatin, carboplatin uh, examples. But, um, and having a stem cell transplant and high doses of radiation to the head and brain can also affect your hearing. And this is often um, seen with ringing sounds in the ear or just generally not being able to pay attention to certain sounds that can occur because you don't hear them. So hearing assessments should be carrying, carried out and hearing aids may be needed. For some people, additional community supports or alternate communication methods may be um, needed as well, just to support the hearing loss and, and living with that hearing loss. Uh, so as we move down, we'll go on to the lungs next. And blood cancer treatments can cause lung damage as a side effect. And, you know, it's important to know about this so you can keep your lungs as healthy as possible. Pulmon pulmonary fibrosis or scarring of the lungs, chronic lung infections and inflammation of the lung tissues can contribute, um, as well as some of the treatments. So particular chemotherapy drugs, um, bleomycin, busulfan, calmestine, lomastine, as well as total body irradiation, as well as radiation to your chest and under the arm and chronic graft versus host disease in allogeneic transplants can contribute. There are also those non-treatment related lifestyle factors that can um, increase the risk of developing lung complications. Smoking is a big one. Uh, secondhand smoke and inhaling drugs can also do this. So it is recommended that yearly respiratory examinations are, are done at your routine check with your doctor. And if there are concerns, um, a lung function test or pulmonary function test may be done and this will actually show any lung problems. So prevention of some of these and changing some lifestyle habits are important to minimize um, the development of some of these long-term effects. Quit smoking, don't start smoking, <laughs> big ones. Regular exercise and avoid inhaling drugs and breathing toxic fumes. And right near the lungs, we have the heart and Treatment with um, chest radiotherapy and anthracycline, so medicines like doxorubicin, dornorubicin, uh, idorubicin, mitosanchoin can cause problems with your heart. And this can um, lead to some 
ventricular uh, function, dysfunction, some heart failure and hypertension. And it is more likely to occur in people who have had really high doses of those medicines or chest irradiation. Smoking, diabetes and hypertension will increase the risk of developing these. So recommendations for follow-up for this is, is an annual blood pressure and heart assessment when you're having routine checkups. And in high-risk patients, echocardiograms or an ultrasound of the heart um, may be performed at regular intervals, and particularly if there is concern at this assessment, and a referral to cardiologist for, or the heart specialist for management of these. Those treated with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so TKI, TKIs are increasingly at risk and may require additional echocardiograms and ECGs to look at the risk of heart disease. So management of your cardiovascular risk factors aggressively is really important. These big lifestyle changes, again, not smoking, regular exercise, and having a healthy diet and reducing weight if the obesity is an issue. And moving right down now, we go on to ovaries and um, testes. So um, infertility and reduced sperm and testosterone production, premature ovary, uh, primary ovarian failure or premature menopause can occur, particularly with uh, having had a hemopoietic stem cell transplant high-dose alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide, busulfan, or those that have had spinal, um, brain, pelvic, lower um, abdominal radiotherapy can impact, as well as if you've had surgery to your brain or ovaries or testes. Um, ovarian failure in women will actually increase the likelihood of osteoporosis developing and of fractures and also can cause, can cause a huge range of um, upsetting symptoms. So hormone replacement is necessary in some of these um, cases, and it really is important to maintain a general well-being as well as um, strong, healthy bones. If you are of um, childbearing age, reproductive age, and you're wanting to start a family, and this is the case um, for some patients, post-transplant, post-high-dose alkylating agents, then a referral to a fertility specialist is recommended. Another component of this is sexual dysfunction in both men and women, and this may be experienced, and it comes in a number of forms of um, reduced hormone production, altered body image, relationship dysfunction, anxiety and depression, and all of these can impact on your sexual response, um, including desire, libido, your arousal and orgasm. So it's really important to manage these symptoms um, that may be contributing to this and talking to your doctor or a referral for a psychologist or counselor to manage some of the anxiety and depression, body image, or even some relationship support may be useful for this. In erectile dysfunction, talk to your doctor about options and, and a referral to the ex, an expert can be done. For females who experience vaginal dryness, lubricants, vaginal moisturizers, and other aids can be used. And some of these can be purchased over the counter and will support uh, improved sexual function. Some life ch lifestyle changes you can do, uh, again, is weight loss and exercise, um, just to help that out as well. And then the next thing we'll talk about is bone health. And I mentioned this earlier, but osteoporosis um, and osteonecrosis or a vascular necrosis of the bone um, can impact on, it can be a long-term effect. And we know that um, for osteoporosis, your bones can become weak and you're, all, you're at more risk of fractures. And in osteonecrosis, the joints are more likely to be affected. And so we want to manage that so you don't have to be in pain and try to reduce your risk of having to have joint replacement surgery down the track. Um, contributing factors or treatments that impact on this are steroids. Corticosteroids are a big one. Prednisone and dexamethasone. Methotrexate, having had a stem cell transplant as well. 
And we also know that myeloma is a risk factor itself as um, it causes weak and brittle bones. So reducing the risk of osteoporosis can be done again through regular weight bearing exercises to maintain healthy bones. Um, a diet high in calcium will aid in prevention and um, your doctor may monitor your vitamin D levels just to make sure they're in a good range and if they're low, supplements may be given. For osteonecrosis, annual physical examination should be undertaken and if there are concerns, an MRI or an X-ray may be um, used to help enable early diagnosis and management. Improving the use of the joint is a goal and that can be difficult if you're having a lot of pain from it. So some of the symptom management for this is pain relief and avoiding activities that put stress on your joints. Um, and also seeing a physiotherapist to support some of those activities. Um, at times, a referral to a bone specialist or a, a bone surgeon may be needed, and that is because a joint replacement may be indicated. So I'm going to move on to the last points about long-term effects for um, blood cancers. And um, this encompasses three things. So three areas I'll cover in this, secondary cancers, fatigue, and psychosocial effects. There is an increased risk in developing secondary cancers in survivors and can be due to a number of factors. Genetics will play a part if you have a cancer predisposition for it, radiotherapy, chemotherapy exposures, and some lifestyle factors like smoking and obesity um, are all contributing factors. So it is important to be aware of this so that you can reduce your risk. Modifying your lifestyle habits may be needed in the prevention, including, again, the big ones, not smoking, um, moderate alcohol intake, regular exercise, and maintaining a healthy weight. It's also really important to adopt sun protection and um, behaviors, sun, being sun smart. Um, wearing sunscreen, wearing a hat, wearing protective clothing are all important at preventing skin cancers, particularly here in New Zealand um, with the harsh sun that we have. So there are also um, some screening recommendations that are important and these are related to particular exposures. But if you have had, if you're female and have had chest radiation, at, particularly at a younger age uh, and a dose of 10 gray or more of radiation, then breast cancer screening should happen. And generally that's about eight years after, eight to 10 years after exposure. And that would be with a mammogram or an MRI. Colorectal cancer screening, those that have had radiation to the pelvis, spine, um, the abdomen, or total body irradiation will also commence at some point. And skin cancer monitoring. So having an annual skin examination uh, is uh, recommended um, because of that risk. The second point here I'm going to talk about is fatigue. And, Fatigue can be physical, it can be emotional, and can include cognitive tiredness and exhaustion. And these things, these are things that interfere with your normal functioning. And it can last just for a few months, or it can last to for a number of years and uh, after your cancer treatment has finished. And it's very individual. But there are other factors that can increase or, um, or exacerbate fatigue, and that's different medications, emotional distress, uh, anemia, poor nutrition and other issues. So really um, these should be addressed first. But trying to help with fatigue, having a healthy, nutritious diet and adequate physical activity are important. And if you monitor your own fatigue levels so you can see, you know, when you have your most energy and when you have the least, then you can look at ways you can pace yourself prioritize your activities and plan activities for when you have the most energy. Psychosocial effects can occur and um, these can, this can actually also be seen as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, social, social isolation, strained relationships with partners and family and friends. Uh, there can also be the financial burden and difficulties with employment or maintaining a job. So your regular checkups and annual psychosocial assessment 
is important just to rule out any underlying causes. And then if need be, so the psychology, psychology support or counselling or medications are options to help um, with these challenging areas. It can actually be useful to engage in support groups, um, utilising support organisations, regular exercise, relaxation, relaxation, um, meditation and yoga as well. And um, actually recently in 2019, there was a study in New Zealand looking at the psychosocial, well, psychosocial well-being of um, people who had uh, blood cancer. And this was a qualitative New Zealand study. Um, 23 people participated with in-depth interviews. And um, you can just see that there's a range of ages that for people that participated as well as ethnicity and cancer type and anywhere from uh, I think two years to eight years of treatment. And three main themes were identified that describe the strategies that enable participants to maintain their psychosocial well-being. Inner strength was the first one and it was an important factor and it helped maintain a positive attitude including the power of positive thinking and um, to help people to recover and then to move forward. Personal connections um, was another identified theme and this was getting support from family and friends, both emotional and practical support. Support from health professionals and support organisa organisations was the third theme and this mainly came from support uh, at follow-up appointments with health professionals and um, most participants spoke positively about their experiences with support organisations. The barriers to psychosocial wellbeing in, in these survivors, in blood cancer survivors, revolved around actually the lack of information and discussion around psychosocial issues, particularly from their health professional. Another barrier was not knowing what resources are available to survivors for psychosocial wellbeing. So um, we've had a look at some of the important long-term effects and talked about you know, what you can do to manage these, but some other things you can do to manage your health is keep an up-to-date record of your treatment, your diagnosis and any complications that have occurred. Have your regular checkups with your GP and participate in screening programs that are relevant to you. Be an advocate for your own health. Really can't enforce that enough. Lifestyle choices is actually one of the biggest things that you can do as well. And I have talked about this throughout the talk, but they can be difficult to change. But just remember, they will be beneficial in keeping you physically and emotionally healthy and having the best possible quality of life and in reducing the risk of developing second cancers. Um, so before I move on, I thought I could take some questions here before I move on to chemo brain. So I'll just quickly have a look at the Q&A. Okay, so the first one is, um, what level of cyclophosphamide dose would you classify as high dose? And okay, so low dose we classify about under about three to four grams as low dose cyclophosphamide. Mid range is about seven to eight grams. And anything right up at the 12, 13, 14, 15, you're coming in 15 grams per meter squared, you're coming into high dose cyclophosphamide. Um, I hope that answers that question. <laughs> um, sorry, it's hard answering questions on Zoom. And then the second one, uh, uh, how accessible are statistics for survival rates of male 75 plus with AML? Oh, that's a very good question. And actually, I'm, I'm sure that there are statistics on that. And um, I think on the Ministry of Health, they have statistics, statistics available for adult cancers, including the survival rates that anybody can access. I don't know the actual link to that, um, but it is available. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. Coming from paediatrics, not sure the exact location of that on the Ministry of Health. Um, it, I feel like it's part of the uh, cancer data. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, 
Okay, so I haven't, there's another question that's come on about impacts on the kidneys and recommended self-care post-treatment, even years on. And I haven't actually covered that. Um, and so for the kidneys, it can be related to the type of treatment that you had. And again, um, I can talk about this from a sort of tumour perspective, but um, kidneys can be affected by the chemotherapy. Some of the uh, alkylating agents, particularly cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide, can cause a hemorrhagic cystitis, so a, a bleeding of the um, a wall of the bladder, but usually that will improve post-treatment. The other thing with kidneys is that a lot of the chemotherapy agents can and can affect your kidney function, um, particularly um, things like methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, and um, that should be monitored during your treatment. And so self-care post-treatment for, I haven't actually looked at this for adults, but in pediatrics and in young adults, what we recommend is um, it's all about still having exercise, but it's also about making sure you have plenty of water to drink um, because that is huge, but also avoiding other things like um, alcohol can impact as well because it can cause dehydration. So managing it from that perspective. I'm happy to provide and look up some resources following this as well for um, kidneys. Sorry, I didn't address that further. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Okay, so um, I'll move on to um, chemo brain. So, um, oh. okay, so um, chemo brain's a, a common term and it's often used to describe the thinking and memory problems that can occur during and after cancer treatment. And you can see all the different things that chemo brain is called by survivors. Um, of blood cancers and it's a widely used term and but the concentration and pro memory problems that happen actually aren't well understood but it's probably a combination of factors that can cause it. Uh, no matter the cause it can be frustrating and it can be a debilitating side effect for some people. There is research being undertaken to better understand um, chemo brain and the changes that people experience and um, uh, this article is actually from a Canadian study that was done. And it was a big study looking at a survivor's three years post-treatment for cancer. And you can see there's a huge number of respondents who participated at 11,877. And 97% of these were over the age of 30. 39% um, of all respondents indicated they had a concern with changes in their um, memory or in changes in their concentration. Only 27% of these actually sought help for their concern. And of these, 48% uh, said they still experienced difficulty in finding help or they just didn't receive any help. So it is a huge thing to think about those numbers. Um, on the next slide here, I've got some quotes from this study um, and how people themselves experienced chemo brain. Most survivors attribute cognitive changes to their treatment. And we know surgery, um, brain surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy can impact. And the most frequent description of what participants experienced included memory loss, particularly the short-term memory loss and an inability to concentrate or focus. And those um, who had been told that it could happen as a possibility, um, uh, experienced worry and, certain, and uncertainty about it happening. But some people who weren't told actually were worried they were experiencing um, dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, so you can see how some people experienced, but some of the other symptoms um, of this mental fogginess and effects, that it all can affect your memory, organization, and um, word retrieval, processing numbers, even just following simple instructions and mul or multitasking, learning new skills, um, even setting priorities or 
actually that visual memory, so recalling an image or a list of words um, are also impacted. The severity of chemo brain and how long symptoms um, last for are variable. Some people find that they are able to move forward after a few months, but for some people it is ongoing or won't improve for years afterwards. Um, most survivors will return to work or to school, but for some it takes extra time and extra energy with the extra concentration needed. And some people unfortunately aren't able to return to work. And so you can see from those people's experience that um, can, it can result in frustration, um, it can result in mood changes and increased anxiety. And it was found from this that withdrawal from social situations occurred because people were trying to avoid feelings of embarrassment. So there are possible factors that can also contribute to the signs and symptoms of chemo brain. The, the cancer diagnosis itself is extremely stressful and can lead to anxiety and depression. And um, these can contribute to thinking and learning and memory problems. The treatment itself, so chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant, as well as immunotherapy can all impact on developing chemo brain. It's important to look at other possible causes, so anemia, fatigue, infection, menopause, sleep disorders, they can all contribute. Um, and if you've had particularly had radiation to the brain, um, or you're of increasing age, then that can also impact. There are no tests to diagnose chemo brain. And even when people have undertaken memory tests, they still range within normal scores. And so it is important to speak to your doctor if you experience any of these symptoms, particularly to rule out anything else that's going on. The treatment as a result, focuses on coping with and managing the symptoms. And um, I'll discuss some of these strategies next. So learning to adapt and cope with the memory changes can help. Um, taking control of other causes of memory issues. So overtiredness, um, being distracted or disorganized um, can impact you know, one way that you can look at how to manage your chemo brain symptoms is to track um, just track them and identify um, times when it may be worse for you if you're hungry or if you're tired. And then you can plan your tasks around um, when you have the most energy to have the extra concentration needed and when you feel your best. Um, doing some games to train your brain, memory and thinking exercises, so some crossword puzzles and Sudoku can help. Um, you may learn new ways of doing everyday tasks. Um, if you read through things and need to remember stuff, taking notes as you go or outlining what has been discussed in your, in your reading. Be organized, use calendars, to-do lists, and put them up around the place so that you can see them frequently. Use your smartphone. Smartphones are great for setting reminders and using apps to track appointments and activities. And if you putting everything written down in your phone or on paper, then hopefully you won't spend time wondering if you've forgotten something or you've forgotten to do something on your to-do list. Organizing your home and your workspaces so that everything has a place, so it will be easy for you to find them can help. And you know, preparing yourself for success. Don't multitask if you need to do something that's complicated prepare for it, know exactly what to do, know the steps involved, pick that best time of the day and you know, make sure you're not hungry. <laughs> that can really help. Um, sometimes noise can be a huge distraction and it can just contribute to poor attention and concentration. So try to find a quiet place. You could use earplugs, even noise cancelling headphones are, are one way to help. And um, divide your tasks into manageable portions. Take a break each time you complete one um, and then have a rest and you'll be able to go back later. If distracting thoughts keep popping up in your head, write it down straight away. Record your thoughts and then you can um, forget them but come back to them because they've been written down. 
stressful situations can make memory and chemo memory and chemo brain worse. So using muscle relaxation, mindfulness practices, um, they can help identify stress and help you cope. Listen to music, meditate, write in a journal. These are other ways that you can um, be supportive of your chemo brain. Avoiding alcohol and other substances that alter your mental state. Eating well, get plenty of sleep and exercise are all great ways. And I think it's really important that you be honest um, with not only your doctors, nurses, but your family and friends about your symptoms and the difficulties that you face. And it can help um, to explain your symptoms to family and friends. And, you know, things like if you're meant to be meeting somebody for a, a coffee date, asking them to remind you both via email or a text message can be helpful. Be easy on yourself. These things, you know, chemo brain to improve it takes time, but you need to work out what works best for you. And, and have fun. Learn a musical instrument, learn a language, learn something new is a great ways for managing chemo brain. Knitting could be an option. Um, this is actually a pilot study published this year that was undertaken and participants um, had their own cognitive concerns. Um, they were recruited to this study and they learned to knit over an eight week period. And 16 people participated and they didn't have any um, disease cancer in their brain. They didn't have any prior knitting experience and their um, cognition and their perceived stress were assessed before and after learning to knit. Participants were on average about 54 years of age and had education of 16 years. And they used neuropsychological tests to assess their cognitive function and perceived stress. So baseline cognitive function was um, average across all domains and perceived stress was actually moderately high. Post-testing though, there were significant improvements in stress, cognitive flexibility and psychomotor speed. Um, there were clinically significant improvements in attention, in memory, 38% um, and 25% of participants respectively. And 69% of participants had clinical improvement in at least one of the cognitive domains on the screen there. So learning something new on knitting, it could really help improve um, chemo brain. Be great to see some more research in this area. Uh, so that's the end, chemo brain. So if any more, put out some questions. Is there any questions? And there are a number of um, resources that you can access on the internet. Um, put these up for you. Yeah. Um, a lot of Americanized ones, but actually really helpful ones. I should have put LBC up on here, sorry. <laughs> um, who also have great resources. Uh, and then just some, you know, my references that I used for some of the information within this. I'll leave it on the resources. Sarah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Are there any more questions before we close? I loved, I loved your um, assessment of knitting. I think a few of us will be picking up the age old <laughs> yeah. skill. Yeah. It's really good, yeah. I was um, pleasantly surprised with those results, yeah. And you even end up with new socks at the end of it. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, exactly. Hey, thank you. That was a really detailed and well-informed session. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. Thanks, Annette. Thanks for having me. Hope it was thank okay. You, Eric.